with you. You may notice that for the last two months, I have uh, shared a number of practical messages with 2019 in mind. You know, where we'll be going from here as a church, the, about, the, about the future of the church. And once again, I'm willing to acknowledge that this year was not an easy year for our church. We had a lot of challenges, but by the grace of God, we have overcome those challenges and this church is moving forward. And, uh, and I believe only great things are in store for this church. And this, I really expect this church to grow in 2019 because I can see God has laid down all the foundations for that. And because of uh, a very dedicated core group of people that we have in this church. And anytime a church is blessed with a core group of people, including ministers, team leaders, and believers, that church will grow. Any living thing grows, okay? So I expect 2019 to be a year of growth for us. So today we will be talking about unity of faith. This is the last message I'm going to preach in that mini series of practical messages that I have been sharing with you. I have, uh, uh, I have uh, talked about everything from participation all the way to finances. Remember the, I remember the first message that I preached in this mini-series was titled, It Takes Everyone. I do not know if you have the notes from those, that if you keep these notes. Okay, we gave out notes, it takes everyone. So everyone's participation is needed for the growth of a church. And last Sunday I talked about the church and the finances, what the Bible teaches about the how the church should handle the finances. So this is a teaching church, and you know that my style is on Sunday morning is to teach the word of, from the word of God, not much um, into revival. Because I believe when you come here on a Sunday morning, and that's the only time I really get you, get you. You know, I I like to teach from the word of God at that time. Amen. Today we will be in the book of Ephesians, primarily in the book of Ephesians and chapter four. The title of the message for this morning is The Unity of Faith. Now, I'm not going to go too much into detail. I want to finish on time, and we have uh, other things to take care of after the after this service. Amen. If you look at uh, the book of uh, Ephesians, Ephesians is a treatise on church. That's where God gave Apostle Paul all the revelation about the church. Remember? Jesus is the one who used the word church first time in the Bible. The only one time in the Old Testament you see the word church because the Israelites were called the Old Testament church or the church in the desert. But in the, after that, the first time someone using the word church is and Jesus mentioned it. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But then... He gave a, a, an overview about the church, told the disciples to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And once the power received upon them, you know, and they will be his witnesses in, in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the way to the uttermost part of the world. And they knew that wherever they go, they preach, people will believe, and uh, a church will come into existence. Now, that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. We looked at that uh, even last Sunday, how the church came into existence and the issues that came with that. Now, but uh, nobody gave a detailed treatise about church, why church is so important, what is church all about, until Paul got this revelation, which is given to us in the book of uh, Ephesians. Chapter, from chapter 1 through 6, if you look at... Uh, um, of the book of Ephesians, each chapter talks about church in a certain condition, you know, certain disposition. And uh, uh, it starts with the church being a mystery that was hidden in the heart of God long before Jesus came into this world. God had planned to bring the church on the scene. And, but for a long time, nobody knew about it. The Old Testament people knew, didn't know about it. The prophets who preached, I mean, uh, prophesied in the Old Testament didn't know about that because it was a mystery hidden in the heart of God. And then when the time came, God revealed it, revealed it. And that's why if you look at the, the progression of things in Jesus' ministry on the face of the earth, until he said, 
I will build up my church. Gates of hell will not prevail against it. Satan left him alone. I want you to pay attention to me. You know, he had the initial temptation in the desert. You know, after his baptism where he was fasting for 40 days. And we know about that in Matthew chapter 3 and Luke chapter 3 and 4, Matthew chapter 3 and 4. But after that, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, Satan was being defeated, 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 defeated each, in each of the miracles. And Jesus was getting more popular, more popular, more popular. Larger and larger crowds were following him and listening to him, etc. Until, until he said, I will build my church and gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, the next day, the attack against him started. The next day, they started hatching plans to crucify him. See, you, know, you that it alone is a clear, clear teaching to us this morning that Satan hates the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? If you think Satan hates you, you don't know how much more Satan hates the church of Jesus Christ. Because that's the ultimate challenge to his authority on the face of the earth. Amen. And that's why he always target church. That's why he always try to dissolve churches. That's why he always try to divide churches. And that's why he always try to bring issues into churches. Because he hate church with a passion. Amen. So if you go to church regularly and you go through spiritual attacks, you know, please realize that Satan is not particularly upset about you, but Satan is more upset about the fact that you go to a church regularly. You attend a church regularly because that's the way Satan is because he know, he does not like, you know, he becomes a very authoritarian figure, you know, I mean, he does not like anything that rises up against the authority that he possesses on the face of the earth. And you know what possesses the, the, author, um, the authority that can stand up to Satan and defeat Satan? It is the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. And church is the instrument through which Jesus wants to defeat Satan on a daily basis long before he will be ultimately, amen, judged. So the book of uh, Ephesians teaches about, about all about church, you know, starting from the time when it was a mystery in the heart of God. And if you look at chapter 5 and 6, it's all about your family, our family life how church members should be in their family lives and even in their civil lives, okay? So it, uh, it, the whole thing is about church. But uh, today I'm not only going to focus on chapter 4, where he talks about the importance of unity in a church. Unity in a church. Amen? You can follow along as I share this with you. If you look at the, the notes that I gave you, it says that uh, in chapter 4, there are two aspects of unity mentioned about a church two aspects first we see in verse 3 he talks about you know he's, it, he talks about a unity that was attained you know he tells us be endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace that's what Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3 tells us that means that we need to maintain unity in a church I will give you all the details in a minute. And the second aspect that he talks about unity is the, in verse 13, where he says, till we all come to the unity of faith. That's where the title of this message came from. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Jesus Christ to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. So he tells us two different things about unity in the church. One, he says we need to maintain the unity. Secondly, later, he says we need to attain unity. So you can see that he's talking about completely different things. Amen? First, he says there is a certain level of unity already given to us. We are already the unified. We are already unified. And we need to maintain that unity. Amen? And where, how, do, how are we unified this morning? Turn around and look. Would you mind to turn around and take a look at the people here this morning? Amen? Look at all the people here this morning. You will realize that we did not all come from the same family. We did not all come from the same country. 
We did not all come from the same culture. Amen. We did not all come from the same economic background. But we are all under one roof worshiping one God. Amen. 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 Why? Because a certain level of unity has already taken place in the church. In the church. And what is that unity that he's talking about? What is the unity that has already come into existence? Let me show you from the same book. Chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible says that uh, he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Having abolished it in his flesh, the enmity. Huh. That's how there is unity in the church. Because of what Jesus did in his flesh. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, we can unify because of what Jesus did in his flesh. So what is the, what is the secret of unity in a church? It's the death of Jesus Christ. Amen. One person dying for all. Amen. And one person becoming the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. Amen. One Jesus didn't die for the Indian people. Then another Jesus didn't come and die for the Caucasian people. Another Jesus didn't come. Or another time did he come and die for the African Americans or the Spanish or other groups. One person, once and for all, dying on the cross for the sake of all the people on the face of the earth. That's why we can be unified. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And that is already given. That's already given. We just need to maintain that. Because Jesus died 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary for all of us. Amen. Somebody has said that when he stretched out his hands. On that cross with one hand he was pulling God to himself. And with the other hand he was pulling man to himself. And bringing unity of both God and man in his flesh. In his flesh. Isn't that what we read in chapter 2 and verse 14? Amen. So he brought man. Was far away from God. And stretched out and pulled man to himself. God was angry at man because of the sinful nature of us. And he was staying away and giving us commands and telling us to do this and that to get back to him. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he called his heavenly father to come to him. And there was a meeting place for God and man. Amen. And that meeting place was in the flesh of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. That's where, the, that's where the unity was born. Amen. And the Bible also says that's where the peace was given. I will talk about the peace in a second. Amen. Hallelujah. So you are no longer in enmity with God. Amen. The enmity has come to an end. Amen. Hallelujah. And because Jesus died on the cross. And that's the beauty of communion. I love to do communion service. And whenever I do communion service, I always quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In case you don't know that verse, can I show this to you? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. This is what we read there. The cup of the blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. I explained to you one time, I believe last year, what Paul meant by that. Because we know this was written almost 2,000 years ago. Uh, uh, actually, it was written 2,000 years ago. And uh, he was talking, about, writing that based on the cultural context in the Roman Empire. Because in the Roman Empire, only two, there were only two groups of people, citizens and slaves. That's it. There were no other groups. Either you were a citizen or you were a slave. All right? So, so in the, in the, all the businesses were owned by the citizens. All the money was, I mean, there was exceptional cases when the slaves raised some money, etc., to buy their freedom and eventually become Roman citizen. But the context, cultural context was this. In the house of a rich man, you know, they lived in extended com compounds, okay? A rich man would buy a large parcel of like, 
uh, like this church has and he will build a house here and then he will build attached homes small small homes attached to his main house where all his slaves would be living so they will be all living in the same compound but they all live the same way they were all all at the same level amen the whereas the citizens lived a privileged life you know slaves were slaves and we know how slaves were treated in this world so what would happen is that uh, the slaves have to always serve the master is always serving the master always cooking the best dishes but it's not for him it's for the master everything that he does is not for himself but for the master but sometimes when the masters will have a dinner they will invite philosophers and other notable figures and they will come and they will have discussions and dialogues etc in the living room and the slaves could come and stand by and listen to it they were allowed to listen to it but never allowed to participate in it are you with me am are you listening to me except when christianity came on the stage when christianity came on the stage everything turned upside down you know what happened the masters became believers and the slaves became believers amen, amen? in the early days of church there was only one church in a city that's why we have our books in the bible titled the church of the corinth church in the corinth church in colossi church in galatia etc there's only one church in one city because christianity is just coming up so in the into that church some of the masters believed in jesus and got saved and took baptism and became members of that church and the slaves also they believed in jesus took baptism and became members of the same church so sunday morning when they came to worship together masters did not sit in one place and the slaves did not sit on another place they all sat together are you with me are you really understanding what i'm saying the depth of what the bible is teaching us amen and uh, and even more revolutionary was what happened at the time of communion at the time of communion in the original time that when we first started communion they did not do communion like we do you know we still try to use one bread as much as possible some sundays i cannot find a big big loaf of bread but if you can find it that's what we use but in those days they used their bread that's like our chapati or roti okay and the way they did communion was that when they talk about passing the bread they are passing the whole loaf of bread and imagine you know the master is sitting all the way in the front and he tears a little piece from that bread you know when the when the minister says okay let's eat that remembering jesus he tear, will tear a little piece of the roti and eat it and then next to him is sitting a slave and then he has to pass that on to the slave and the slave will take a little piece from that same bread and next to him as it passes you know both the masters and the slaves are eating from the same bread literally that's why paul said we who are many who have come from many different background has become one one in jesus christ and the the proof that we have become one in jesus christ is that we take part from the same bread oh you're staring at me like i'm speaking in greek can you imagine the depth of what he is saying in a society that had classes and strict rules about classes strict rules about social behavior strict rules about who can marry whom who can interact with whom in the midst of all of that here came the church of jesus christ breaking down all the walls of separation yeah. hallelujah amen that's why paul said in ephesians jesus when jesus came in his flesh he not only brought god to himself and man to himself and provided a meeting place for god and man he also broke down everything that separated man until then amen one new man in christ of both jew and gentile amen so in the church of jesus christ 
That's why Paul says in the book of Galatians, there is, no, there is no Jew, neither Gentile. There is no free man, there is no slave. There is no rich man, there is no poor man. Because we are all one. Check to somebody and say, we are all one. So, so the question is, can you maintain that oneness? Can you maintain that unity in real life? Yes, conceptually, you know, it sounds good. When I share from the Word and teach from the Word, it sounds so exciting, sounds so nice. But can you, can you do that in real life? Amen? Can you treat the person sitting next to you as yourself? Hmm? Hello? I'm asking you. I know this is a tough message. Okay? Can you, tr can you treat everyone in this, this church? Forget about people outside. Everyone in this church, can you treat all of them the same way? Are you able to do that? That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Amen? Inside, inside the church, the unity is already given. All we have to do is maintain it. Amen? We need to maintain that unity. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now listen, in, um, the Bible says that uh, in order to maintain that unity, there must be peace. Huh? Are you with me? There must be peace. So what is peace? Peace is the absence of strife. Amen? Now, naturally, there are so many things that are dividing us. Amen? I don't eat the same food some of you eat. You know, the food that I eat is too hot for some of you. You will come to me and say, Pastor, that food is so spicy. How in the world do you guys eat that? You know? And I come to you, your place, and I see some of the food you eat. No cinnamon, no black pepper, no red pepper, nothing. It's so bland. And I turn around and I ask you, how in the world can you eat this? This has no taste. Am I telling the truth here? Am I telling the truth here, folks? Yes. Amen? Hallelujah. And, and some of you come to my house and you smell curry all over the house. <laughs> and you want, don't want to enter into my house. You will say, no, no, pastor, thank you for the invitation, but my, how, my expensive clothes going to smell like curry when I leave from here. I mean, so many things differentiate us. We are not the same in the natural. We don't think the same in the natural. Our goals are not the same in the natural. Are, are you with me? Amen. But so, and the Bible does not negate that. Bible does not present a blind eye to the realities of life. But the Bible says, nonetheless, when you come to church, you are one. 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 It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter in which culture you grew up. You are one. Amen. Hallelujah. So we have to maintain that uh, peace. Only then we can have that unity. Amen. So it's not an easy job. Every member of a church must be willing to invest into maintaining the unity in the church. Are you with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Two things I want to show from there before I go on. Number one, it's hard work. It's hard work. Amen. You look at the maps. I mean, look at the flags in this church. You know, there's an Italian flag missing here, there. Okay, we have somebody from Italian background also in this church. But still you can see how many flags are here. These all represent people you know, who are members in this church. You all came from all these nations. Okay, at least one person came from one of a nation that is represented by one of these flags. We all didn't come from the same culture. We all didn't come from the same background. So how can we really say we are united? It is hard work. You had to work hard on it. I mean, I need to invest time into understanding you. And you need to t invest time into understanding me. Amen. And you know, that's why fellowship is so important in a church. 
Fellowship is so important in a church. That's why intentionally on Father's Day, we have turned the Father's Day into International Day. And we say on that day, I want all of you to bring your national, something from your national background, uh, you know, a dish cooked with your way. So we can all taste and see how is food cooked in your nation. Amen. And you want to know something? On that day, usually we end up with a five to seven different chicken dishes. Listen to me. Okay. Five to different chicken dishes brought from people from five to seven different countries. And you know, all of it is chicken, but all of it tastes different. So I take a little bit of Indian chicken. I take a little bit of Jamaican chicken. I take a little bit of Haitian chicken. You know, I take a little bit of Nigerian chicken, etc. You know why? Because it's all, even though it's all chicken dishes, all of it, same, it tastes different. Why? Because we all came from different background. Amen. Amen. But we can work on it. Amen. And we can maintain, we can maintain the unity. Amen. It is hard work. That's why I gave you this paper. Okay. That's why I gave you this paper. You will read it later, but uh, if you look at the title of this article written by a church growth specialist named Ed Stetzer, um, Dr. Ed Stetzer is a very famous uh, man in this country, Christian leader in this country. See, so if you look at that paper, it says three realities of multicultural churches. Three realities of multicultural churches. You know, reality number one. You know, it says just because your church looks different, it doesn't mean that you are really different. So basically what he's talking about is not about gateway. He's talking about a mainline American church. If you go into a mainline American church, you know, usually there is Caucasian people and there are African American people. But both of them are Americans. Are you with me? Okay. So if you're, let's say you have been living in this country, you know, for four or five generations at least, you know, well, it doesn't matter whether your foreparents came from England or where your foreparents came from Africa. It doesn't matter. Because for the last four or five years, you were living in this country and you became Americanized. So all the Caucasian Americans and the African Americans think this more or less the same way. If you look around, their thinking is same. So even though you, when you look from the stage, you see two different colors, it doesn't really mean you're multicultural because both of you are Americans. That's the first thing that he's saying. Okay, and the second thing that he's saying is that uh, if you really surrender to the call of God to build a multicultural church like I did, you're looking for trouble. That's the second thing, second point he makes. You're really looking for trouble. Why? Because people think differently. We are all culturally conditioned a certain way. Are you with me? Amen. We come from a culture, we come from a culture. If Mercy go to India, you know, and Mercy is given a chance to preach, let she preach over here. She cannot preach the way she preach over here. There's no way she's going to wear her pants and preach in India. No way. You know, not only that she has to wear an Indian cloth, she also has to cover her head. Otherwise, the pastor will say, Sister, your message may be good, but you go sit down because you're offending our culture. Are you with me? Okay, that's why he says that if you really step, step out and accept the call to start a multicultural church, you're looking for trouble, man. Are you willing to accept that trouble? And I know it is trouble because I've been pastoring this church for a number of years now. So I know how, you know, how certain people say, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. You know, when they say that's not right, that's not right, they are not saying that that person is not right. What they are saying is that I came from a different culture and because of that, I cannot accept what that person is doing. Are you with me? For example, until I started Gateway, I never hugged a woman other than my wife in my whole life. Because we come from a culture, we don't even hug our own daughters once they reach a certain age. That's a culture. That's how conservative the culture from where we came from. And then all of a sudden I started gateway and everyone was started coming hugging me. And you know, first uh, couple of years, it was so tough for me. And I, I, unknowingly, I will go like this. You know, oh, oh, here comes another sister to hug me now. 
Because I did not come from a culture like that. Are you with me? So when you intentionally surrender to start a multicultural church and God has called you to do that, you're looking for trouble. And you know what trouble? You have, that means you have to constantly adjust. You have to constantly learn. Why? Because we need to maintain the unity. Are you with me? So in order to maintain the unity, it is hard work. You know what is hard work? I have to change and you have to change. Because we represent multiple culture, cultures here. Amen? What is culturally acceptable may not be culturally acceptable to you. What is culturally acceptable to you is not, may not be multi, culturally, culturally acceptable to me. So that means you need to change and I need to change. And we all need to change. Are you with me? That's what Paul meant by you need to work hard on maintaining the unity of the church. Amen? So can you turn around to somebody other than your husband or wife and say, tell them that you need to change. We all need to change. We all need to change. Amen? Now, <laughs> okay. Now, the third point, let me just quickly mention, then you can read this later. And the third point that he makes is this. You know, when you start a multicultural church, it grows slower than a single cultural church. And it's a reality. We know, we know that reality. We face that reality. You know why? Because everyone who comes here as a visitor, to even today we have a, a sister, a new sister here as a visitor. And we, we, loved, we love the fact that almost every Sunday there's at least one person visiting that church. And you want to know, when that person comes as a visitor to this church, they are naturally looking around. Okay, who is the pastor of this church? Who is in the worship team? Who, you know, who are the ushers here? Who got up in the service to do something? You know? And then they will look around the audience and say, who is seated here? How many of my people are here? Are you with me? It's only natural. It's only natural. Natural human thinking. So I have seen for years that people will come, look around, and at the end of the service, will say, Pastor, the message was good. The worship was good. You know, and I'll, I will ask them, can I hope to see you next Sunday? Definitely, Pastor. <laughs> but I never see them again. <laughs> never see them again. You know why? Because some people are not comfortable in a multicultural church. They are more comfortable in a single cultural church. So they may come here, irrespective of what this church can offer, irrespective of what is happening in this church and where this church is going, they don't want to be part of this because that's, they are not comfortable. So we all have comfort levels. So what the third point this man makes is that uh, when you start a multicultural church, don't expect the church to explode overnight. It will not happen. Because you are drawing people from this culture, this culture, this culture. They all have to come and come to a happy medium and be at free in their spirit. Only then they will fully identify with the church. Amen? Only then they will fully start doing something for the church. Amen? Only then they will say, come and say, Pastor, come on. I'm going to give you the hand, my hand. My family is going to stand with you. I believe in your vision. I believe in what God is doing in Gateway. I believe in where God is taking Gateway. I'm going to support. My family is going to support you. You have my 100% support. Only then they will say that. So it is hard work. And the Bible acknowledges it is hard work. It's not easy. Amen? Because we are all different. Now, I want to show you one more thing before I run forward. Amen? And, uh, and you know what is the, in, in, uh, the second thing or the third thing mentioned in that passage? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. See, it is the work of the Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit can break down the walls of prejudices that are in our heart. Are you with me? Has Holy Spirit done that? Has Holy Spirit done that in the pages of the Bible? Recently, I remember in one of my messages, I don't know whether it was here or not, I talked about Paul going to the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And when he walked into that house, he was a 100% Jew with all the prejudices a Jewish man has, which was number one, Gentiles are lower than you. 
They actually used to call them dogs privately. Gentiles are lower than you. Number two, a Jewish man will never eat with a non-Jewish man because he eats kosher food and they eat non-kosher food. Number three, if you touch them, it makes them unclean, so they don't want to touch them. Yet, God twisted his hand to go into the house of Cornelius. Even when God showed him a vision, he rejected that vision. Remember the vision at the beginning of that chapter? He rejected that vision and he said, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. I'm going to be a Jew for the rest of my life. That's what he said. But then God twisted his hand, took him to that house. What did he do when he went to that house? As soon as he started talking about Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit fell upon all of them. And people started speaking in tongues, just like he and the his friends who went with him did on the day of Pentecost. And that opened their eyes. And they said, if God has pleased to send them the Holy Spirit, just like he sent the Holy Spirit to us, how can we deny water of baptism to these people? I need to baptize them. I need to look beyond my prejudices. Amen? So who helped Peter to get over his prejudice? It's not the arguments. It's not the Jewish council. It's not the Sanhedrin. It's the Holy Spirit. Amen? Do you know who is going to help you to love a person of a different color? Who is going to help you to treat a person of a different color same as you? It's the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's why Paul said in Acts, I mean, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3, it's through the Spirit that we can have peace. Through the Spirit we can have peace in the church. If it's not for the Holy Spirit, there will be always issues in the church. Again, we know that it's true. In Acts chapter 6, that's what happened, right? Just about food. They said, oh, the people who are serving the food is giving more food to this group of people than to this group of people. And they had issues in the church. If we are not controlled by the Holy Spirit, church will be full of problems. But if everyone in this church is controlled by Holy Spirit, we will have absolutely no problem. It will be a beautiful scene of heaven on earth. All of us worshiping, coming from different backgrounds and different culture and worshiping God together. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Amen. Sister Magali. All of us can live together. All of us can worship together. All of us can function together. But we just need the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the question this morning is this. Are you controlled by the Holy Spirit? Or are you controlled by your natural prejudices? Every one of us has prejudices. Including this preacher has prejudices. Because we are all human beings. Okay. But when the prejudice disappear, is when I'm controlled by Holy Spirit. Are you with me? When you're moved by Holy Spirit. That's the beauty of missionary work. Okay? Now, um, a little bit of time. So let me give you a little example. You know, this, we, our mission, main mission work is in India. You know, India was a, a, a conglomerate of 6,000 little, little city-states until British people came. So they were all divided into so many cultures, so many different uh, thinking, etc. Certain parts of India, they eat snakes. They eat snakes, okay? And the, and the worst thing is that well, they, they don't eat the snake right away. Like the, I hear that in Texas you can get rattlesnake steaks, okay? But it's not like that. They actually kill the snake and they hang the snake in the house until the meat is rotten. And then they, then they eat it. Okay, this is a real culture in India, in, in northern parts of India. And the first time a missionary went to take, the, take in the gospel from the south India to the northern parts of India to this culture, to his surprise, when they sat together for dinner, he realized he's the only one who was given the snake meat. Everyone else had rice and dal. 
And you know why? Because he was the main guest. And this was the most precious meal they had. So they wanted to give the precious meal to the main guest. You know, and everyone else was eating rice and dal. So this man, you know, being sharp, he looked around. He looked around and he, and he realized, man, I'm the only one. And it smells so bad. You know what he did? He saw a, a elderly man sitting all the way at the end of the table. He got up from his seat, took the plate in his hand and said, Today, I am so grateful you gave me the choices, food you have, but I want to honor this father. <laughs> so he took the snake meat to the elderly man and took the rice and dal back to him and ate the rice and dal. You know, those are challenges of missionary work. Another pastor friend of mine, went to a different parts of, uh, this is Punjab is actually usually a, one of the wealthiest states in India, but, uh, but even there you have, you know, subgroups who live in a different way, very low class life. I should, you know, when I mean the economically very, very low strata. So he said that they work they, with the same hand, you know, they don't have money to fix the floor. So you know how they fix the floor? With the cow dung. They literally, not wearing a gloves, with the bare, bare hands, they spread cow dung all over the floor to fix the floor, you know? And, and then they put their, a mat on it, and that's how they sleep. That's all they can afford. But the funny thing is, is, this man was in a house sharing the gospel with these people, and he saw them, when he walked in, they were spreading the cow dung all over the floor. And to his surprise, when they found out he's a pastor, they wanted to honor him. And they boiled egg and made hard boiled egg with the same hand that was spreading the cow dung. They opened the egg and gave it to him without washing. And he said the egg was completely black in color. So he has a choice to make now. Do I eat this or do I don't? If I don't eat this, I offend these people, I offend their culture because they're very hospitality minded even then. And I will never get a chance to come back to this village and share the gospel. If I want to share the gospel with these people, if I really want to show the love of Christ to these people, I need to eat this egg. So he closed his eyes, closed his nose, and ate the egg. Unity is hard work. Amen? Unity is hard work. Because we are all come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different thinking, different prejudices. Amen? So, so we, it's hard work. But Holy Spirit can take us beyond all of that. Hallelujah. Amen? So turn to somebody and say, you need Holy Spirit. If you don't have Holy Spirit, you'll be looking at your brother and your sister in the natural and when you look in the natural, what stands out is the difference. You know, it's the differences. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are, you, it's like a new glasses with a new shade. And the shade is called the love of Jesus Christ. And when you look through the eyeglasses of the love of Jesus Christ, you don't see the difference. You see, only see a brother or sister in Christ. Amen. Amen? So, can I ask you to do something? I'm not done with my message, but reach out to somebody who looks different from you and tell them you're my brother or you're my sister in the Lord. Come on. Yeah, we're going to take a one minute break. Okay? Walk over to somebody who is not from your culture, not from your country. Amen. Not from your background. And, and, and tell them that you are my brother or you are my sister. Hallelujah. Amen. Please take your seats again. Praise you, Jesus. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 tells us in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. 
Amen. Not only we take part from one bread when we uh, uh, celebrate communion, but we also drink from the same Holy Spirit. Amen. There's only one Holy Spirit. There's no multiple Holy Spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit. All of us drink from the same Holy Spirit. So you know what does that tell me? That a Holy Spirit per filled person cannot hate another person. You may be different from me. You know, in the natural I may not like you. But the Spirit of God in me humbles me to love you. To reach out to you. To uphold you. You know, hold you as a person of high value. And treat you as a person of high value. Hallelujah. So there's no room for hatred in church. I'll have a little more to talk about that in the second part of this message. So, one more thing I want to tell you before we move forward. The gifts of, not only we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we also need the fruit of the Holy Spirit. As we read in Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. Amen. Once we exhibit the gifts, uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, your lifestyle changes, your attitude changes, and there will be unity of faith in the church. Amen. Hallelujah. And the second part of this message is this. So he talked about already a unity that is given to us. How did we get that unity? Because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's what we discussed all this time. Then in the same chapter, in verse 13, he says, but at the same time, there's a unity yet to be attained. Yet to be attained. Even though we have been uni unified at the foot of the cross, and we have been made one, we have one baptism, one Bible, one Heavenly Father, one Holy Spirit, one communion table, there is unity everywhere in Christianity. But at the same time, he says, there's another unity yet to be attained. And you want to know what that is? Where he mentions that? He mentions that when he talks about the ministers of the church. Isn't that interesting? If you look at chapter 4, verse 9 onwards, he's talking about the ministers. God appointing ministers in the church. God giving officers and ministers in the church. He talks about apostles, pastors, teachers, prophets, etc. Amen. And then he says that... Uh, God gave the apostles, God gave the pastors, God gave the teachers, God gave the prophets to the church so that we all can attain the unity of faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. So, you know whose job it is to make sure there is unity in the church? It's the job of the ministers, job of the leaders in the church. Are you with me? Because that's what God ordained them for. That's why God gave apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors to the church. Amen. So that there will be unity in the church. So what is the root? What is the job of a minister? Not only to teach, not only to prophesy, not only to be an apostle and oversee the whole thing, but he also has to make sure there is unity in the church. Hmm. I told you this is a tough message. <laughs> Amen. If as your pastor, if I am not striving to create unity in this church, I'm failing God. If the other ministers in this church is not striving to maintain unity and bring unity in this church, we are failing God. Because that's what God gave your officers to the church for. Amen. Again, I told you that we are all different, so issues can come some, some other time. I remember a few weeks ago, I, I, I spoke about bitterness. And uh, at that time, we saw that every bitterness has a root. There's a root. There's a reason why there is bitterness. Okay? But it's the minister's job, the leader's job, to find out, dig deep, and find out what is the root cause of this bitterness and take care of it before it grows into a big tree and destroys the entire work of God. Amen? Hallelujah. So we need to strive, strive to attain that unity. And you know how do we know when we attain the unity? When we attain the unity, we will all believe the same thing. Listen to me. Well, all the, the multiple aspects of that given to us in that verse. I'm going to quickly finish this. Number one, we will all believe the same things. Amen. It is possible because of Christian television, Christian radio, so many books out there, etc. Even the people in the same church believe so many different things. 
Not everyone is on the same page. Okay? So unity of faith, one of the aspects of unity of faith is all of us are on the same page. And you know how we do that? Through the teaching of the word of God. That's why this church gives such a premium importance to teaching of the word of God. So that we can attain the unity of faith. Number two is that uh, we will all know the, uh, the uh, or I should say a lot about the Son of God. Because he says the, the unity of, of faith also is measured by how much you know about Jesus. Are you with me? That's why I don't take time to just talk about other things in my messages. I try to teach simply the Bible. And we, we rather talk about Jesus than anything else. Amen. And that's why this is not a bless me club. That's why this is not a positive uh, thinking club or whatever. You know, we talk about Bible because uh, our unity of faith depends on how much we know about Jesus. Number three, unity of faith also, faith also is a measure of our stature in Christ. How far we have grown. How far we have grown. Because God expects you to grow. Can, can you turn to somebody and say, God expect you to grow? God expect you to grow. Have you grown in 2018? Have you spiritually grown in 2018? Do you know Bible more than more now than you knew in 2017? Do you know more about Jesus Christ now than you knew in 2017? Amen. There's only one way to accomplish that. You need to take time. Amen. You need to come for meetings. You need to listen to the way the messages that we preach. You need to come to the Bible study on Friday. Amen. You need to come and fellowship on Wednesday. Because when we do that, we are growing. We are growing. We are growing. Amen. The mission of the church is to grow people. Are you with me? The mission of evangelism is to save people. A church should do evangelism and save people. When, when, but once people come to church, the mission of the church is to grow people. And if we are not growing you, we are failing as a church. But sometimes we can do all we are capable of. But if you don't participate with us, we cannot help you to grow. Amen? So it's so important. So there's a unity that's already given to us. Through the death of Jesus Christ, you all have to work hard to maintain that. That is a second unity that God expects all of us to attain. And that's by increasing our knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ. And we all need to work hard for that also. So Christian life is hard work. Amen? Christian growth is hard work. It's not easy. It's not going to be dropped into your lap. It takes time. It takes time to spend in prayer. You need to spend time in prayer. You need to spend time in the Word. You need to spend time in fellowship with other people. Only then you can grow. And the more we grow, the, our thinking changes. Amen. We get farther and farther away from the prejudices that kept us away. And we come together and we come unified. And we can be unified. And we can really say there is unity of faith in my church. Amen. Are you, are you ready for that? Are you ready for that in 2019? Are you ready to grow? Are you ready to acknowledge that I need to grow? Amen. Can you turn to somebody and say, I need to grow some more? Amen. Come on, come on. Don't be ashamed to say that. We all need to grow. We all need to grow. I'm also growing every single day. Amen. So turn to somebody and say, we all need to grow. Amen. Until the unity of faith is established, until we reach that stature in Christ that God expects of us, we need to continue to grow. And we need to work on our Christian walk. Amen. And that's where God is going to take us in 2019 as we are coming to the end of 2018. This is the last practical message I'm going to preach this year. Amen. Starting next Sunday, we'll be talking about Christmas, etc. Amen. So stand up with me all over this place. Hallelujah. 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 Can I ask you a simple question? Will you be truthful with me this morning? How many of you are ready to say, only if you are truthful? Okay, I'm looking forward to growing spiritually in 2019. 
Can I see the hands of every person? Looking forward to grow spiritually in 2019. So guess what? Every hands that went up, I expect to see you every Sunday in 2019. Amen. Yes, I'm glad you're clapping for that. Thank you for your support. <laughs> We're going to grow together. Amen. All of us are going to grow together. Amen. You know this Bible, this church is a church that teaches Bible. Amen. You just show up here, you will grow. I can guarantee you, you just show up here, you will automatically grow. Because we give you a solid diet of scriptures every week. Amen. You will grow. I can guarantee you. You just have to show up. Amen. And second thing, if you found it difficult, despite coming to Gateway, to treat everyone the same, just be truthful this morning. Because I told you, all of us have prejudices, all of us have cultural conditioning, etc., etc., etc. If that is the story of your life, after service, only you go and shake hands with certain people. Never bother to go and shake hands with some other people. We're going to break that tradition today. We're going to break that today, okay? Because we are one. We are one. Amen. As long as I have breath, as long as I have breath in my nostrils, I will keep proclaiming that we are born, we are one. Amen. So it's starting today, intentionally, you're going to skip your usual group, you know, that usual clique you always hang out with, go to somebody else. Amen. So you're going to go to, when the usual person come to you, you know, the regular people, you know, who you always, every Sunday you spend time with, when they come to you, say, sister, I have nothing against you but I need to go and talk to somebody else from starting today. Amen? So that we intentionally going to work on this. And we're going to become a kaleidoscopic church, a rainbow church. Amen? Amen? A church people from all different walks of life coming together, united by the bond of love that is in Christ Jesus. And indeed showing the world that we can be one. Amen? And that's the mission of Gateway. And be part of that mission. And God will bless you. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray.